Welcome to Cool Explorations. I'm your host, Tony Peters. Today we're going to be looking at The Gospel by Mike O'Dowd, and we're going to be looking at the section on letting God's promises be our guide uh, throughout our life, and uh, it is a very important lesson for us to know, uh, referencing starting in Exodus 19, uh, and uh, we'll move on from there. So today, yeah, we're going to be talking from Exodus 19, 1 to 6 to start with, uh, and that reads, uh, On the third moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on the eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Uh, and we can tie this back a little bit to Genesis 10 uh, to 12 uh, and take a look uh, at how the nation simply seemed to come into the scene uh, in God's story of redemption and restoration and God's promises to bring uh, blessings to the nations uh, through the great nation God would bring through Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel. Uh, and then this shift uh, to the nation represents a significant turning point in the restoration and redemption story. Uh, therefore, uh, over the next little bit here, we'll kind of take a look at uh, the nation of Israel and the role of blessings in, in their lives. Uh, so in Exodus 19.5, God promises the people of Israel, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Uh, the phrase treasured possession speaks of a prized piece of property, a sense of new, uh, a sense that it's, uh, you know, your special treasure, um, something you hold dear to yourself. Uh, and who among us wouldn't long to hear God utter those words to us? Uh, and it can be a real great guide for us. Uh, so God will go to great lengths to keep Israel close to himself uh, and keep them following him. Uh, and so God confirms work uh, through our lives. Uh, and he confirms this work through promises um, that have no expiration date. It doesn't say, oh, by this date, you know, that promise is gone. No, those promises are eternal promises. Uh, and uh, if you look at it, God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 17, 7 to 8, he says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your so uh, sojournings, sojournings, all the land of Canaan. For an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So here God is promising both Abraham and his descendants uh, an everlasting relationship with God and that continues through to us today. Uh, it's still in effect. It has not ended. Uh, and then Genesis 15 13 God also told Abraham his descendants would live for a period of 400 years in a foreign land become oppressed there and ultimately be delivered by God from that oppression back into the promised land. And that's where you see Exodus take place, is, is the fruition of that promise uh, and what happened there. And Exodus 2, 23 to 25 says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Uh, so if you look at this, God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a promise of everlasting relationship uh, and that they would get to a land, the, the promised land. Uh, and Exodus 3, 
through 19 uh, tells us the account of God raising up Moses to deliver Israel out of that bondage and uh, brings them into the wilderness of Sinai and a journey that would end up in the promised land that they were given, which was not going to be an easy journey. Um, and uh, God would definitely have to rebuke them at times and teach them, but his promise held true. Exodus 19.4 says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on the eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So this work of bringing his people to himself is done with the utmost tenderness and care. He loves the people of Israel. He loves us today uh, and uh, will always love us. And uh, he will always deliver us from from our tr uh, troubles and trials. Uh, and uh, we'll learn and we'll grow from those trials. But ultimately, they will bring us closer to God and our relationship to God. And we just need to seek God and to try to keep that relationship going, the communication going through prayer, scripture reading. It's all very important. Uh, so the metaphor of the eagle's wings is a picture of loving compassion, protection, strength, and watchfulness that God provides for the people of Israel. He provides for us. Uh, and uh, young eagles are carried on adult wings uh, and brought out of their nests and taught to fly. So the Lord lovingly carried and safely delivered Israel. So Deuteronomy 32, 9, 11 describes it like this. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, Jacob, his allotted heritage, he found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its, uh, its young, spreading out its wings, catching them and bearing them on its pinions. God's work of delivering his people through Moses was part of his work in keeping an age-old covenant promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, his present work of bringing people uh, into his presence in the wilderness of Sinai, uh, which was God's confirming work, and it confirms that his promises know no delays uh, and that they still apply today. Back in Exodus 3.11, he, before he had embraced his God's appointed, God appointed role as Israel's deliverer, Moses asked him, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? From Moses' perspective, this task was uh, an insurmountable challenge. Pharaoh was the ruler of a superpower which was presently enslaving the people of Israel. How could Moses possibly bring about their deliverance? And even if he could, what next? Uh, so it came down to a bit of a faith issue and God having to uh, teach Moses faith. Uh, and uh, that's something we can learn from today is faith. Is We need our faith. We need to be strong in our faith and in our conviction so that God can use us and work in us. Israel had grown to a nation uh, of more than a million people in Egypt. If bringing them out of Egypt seemed impossible, bringing such a number of people into the wilderness beyond Egypt was maybe even more impossible. How could the lives of more than a million people be sustained in a barren desert wilderness? Uh, and again, faith that God would provide and can provide. Uh, so even in light of these harsh realities, Exodus 3.12 tells us about God giving a promise in response to Moses' question. He says, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. The mountain God is referring to here is the mountain of, in the wilderness of Sinai, where Moses and the people of Israel are led in Exodus 19, 1-2. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from uh, Rephidim, I'm sure I'm slaughtering that name, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. So God fulfilled that promise pretty quickly uh, within the, the, the time, uh, which 
should be a sign to Moses and the people that God was serious and God's promise was going to hold true. Uh, so God's promise to Moses to bring them out of the um, to this mountain after the people had come out of Egypt. Uh, it's a task that had a whole pile of impossible steps along the way. It, it was not an easy trip. Uh, so he <laughs> had to part the Red Sea and that seems impossible but they've already found all the historical stuff to prove that it did happen uh, and that it happened the way the Bible says uh, and it was God's promise and leading and guidance and protection and love uh, that he did that as the first one of the first steps of bringing them out uh, once they were out of out of Egypt uh, it was one of the first steps to, to really show them uh, that he had their back he was going to fulfill his promise uh, and God brought them to himself uh, and through impossible and into more impossible and he did it all in his own time in God's perfect timing uh, which is something we need to remember for ourselves here as well is God's perfect timing God knows what's best for us he knows what the timing is going to look like we just need to trust and have faith. Uh, so on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, uh, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. So not only is the impossible not a hindrance for God, it is something that shows us awe and awe that God can do the impossible. What we deem impossible is possible for God. God can do it. And we need to let this be our guiding light that God can do all things. He is all powerful. Uh, and take, take uh, some comfort in that. Some trust and faith comes with that, but comfort that God has you. He has your back. Uh, Exodus 19.5 begins, Now therefore... Uh, which is capturing the sense uh, in the Hebrew text that given the fact that God had made uh, great promises to his people, he was going to keep them, and he did keep them fully, right up till today. Uh, the faithful can be assured that his promises will result in a future under his great care and blessings. Verse 5 and 6 read, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to Israel. The first part of God's promise to Israel is conditional, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. So we need to keep God's commandments. We need to follow God and trust God and keep our relationship going with God and let him be our guide uh, and turn to him in times when we feel we're struggling. Uh, we've already kind of touched a little bit on Israel's place as God's treasured possession uh, and this continues uh, to go through to today and it is contingent upon obedience uh, and Israel failed to obey on many, many occasions, and God always brought them back, and he always he taught them he taught them many lessons, and they were some of them were hard lessons. But at the end, when they repented and they turned back to God, things were right again. And that's how it is for our lives. We need to repent, we need to ask for forgiveness, and God will bring us back to him and we will come to him but it has to be a choice we have to make that choice uh, and in romans 11 1 paul says i ask then has god rejected his people in other words has god turned from his own promises paul answers his own question he says by no means uh, so no no he hasn't like he's not going to turn his back on his promises he made a promise he's going to keep it uh, and in when we look at Malachi 3 16 to 18 it kind of brings us into perspective a little bit about how God won't reject his people um, and that he hasn't uh, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another 
the Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him, and those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, again he uses treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Just as we have seen throughout our tracing of God's story and redemption, uh, of redemption and restoration, humanity walks through two paths before the Lord. Uh, so we see this distinction noted here in Malachi between the righteous and the wicked. The righteous are those who fear the Lord and esteem his name and serve him. And the people of Israel always reflected this two, twofold way. Uh, and as the Lord says here in Malachi, the righteous shall be in his future day when he makes up his treasured possession. Uh, and it mentions what was mentioned in 19.5. It's that, that covenant, same covenant, going through and carrying through throughout the scripture, throughout the, the Old Testament. It, we see that promise continuing to carry through, which should be a sign to us that it will carry through to today and for all of us. Uh, and it's something again you can take comfort in knowing that God will keep his promise uh, in this future tense God will bring this to pass God's promises has no expiration and they're in his time we don't know his timing but God knows his timing and we just have to trust they will happen when God wants them to happen and it will be the perfect timing uh, not always on our time as we would like it but on God's time and God will make it happen uh, the action rises in the biblical story and the foreshadowing to the future redemption and restoration intensifies uh, so outside of Exodus 19 we can take a look at uh, Romans 9 6 to 8 where after making the argument that the fullness of God's promises to his people of Israel uh, will remain in effect uh, despite appearances of the contrary. Paul teaches us uh, this, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So when we take a look at this, despite the seeming impossibility of the promise that a son named Isaac would be born to an elderly Abram and Sarai, Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted it to him as righteous as righteousness. Genesis 15 verse 6. God's eternal promises to Israel will come to pass even those who are true children of Abraham, who reflect Abraham's faith in the Lord. Uh, this promise will be realized by a faithful remnant. Uh, and again, those who aren't faithful, those who don't trust in God, those who don't follow God or his ways, they aren't counted in this. They are not in with the righteous. So Romans 9.27, Paul quotes from Isaiah as part of his argument that God's promises remain in effect. He will keep his promises to faithful Israel. Uh, Paul quotes here, he says, In that day the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God, for through your people... Israel be as the sand of the sea. Only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end, as decreed in the midst of all the earth. It, Isaiah 10, 20-23 Eternity will have a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a uniquely treasured possession among all the nations on earth. The remnant of Jacob will return. God has decreed it. He has said it will happen, so it will happen. He, his promises do not fail. He is true to his word. And for we who have been grafted into this pro pro promise uh, of the Gentiles, 
this teaching should be a comfort and should teach us about redemption and restoration in our Christian walk. Uh, and we need to live like this is a guide, a light for us. In humanity's dark history towards God's people of Israel, we who have been grafted in ought to honor God's chosen people. Sadly, the church has been part of this dark history uh, many times throughout history. Uh, perhaps foreseeing the potential for this, Paul warns the church in Romans 11, 17, to 8, uh, 17 and 18, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Uh, so this does not give us the right to do wrong. It tells us that we need to have a right attitude towards God and they need to align with God's promises, God's purposes. They need to align with that. So prayer, biblical reading, talking to your, your church, going to your church, uh, fellowshipping with other Christians, all important in building this righteousness that we need and that foundation of the Bible, of God's word, to guide us and be our light. We need to make sure we are in alignment and obedience to God. And uh, going to church regularly is a big part of that because it really helps you learn and get a foundation and get you speaking with other believers. Same with Bible studies and discipleship. Very, very important. And then from there, being equipped and going out to share God's word. And that is so important. Uh, that is what we are called to do. That is what God demands of us. And it is all part of following God and trusting in his promises. Uh, we must serve the Lord as a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And Peter applies this status to the church in 1 Peter 2.9. Uh, the role of a priest is to stand between God and people to help bring the people closer to God and making God's truth, justice, favor, discipline, and holiness known to them. So taking God's expectations of Israel in this role as a model, Christians are called to live as examples of God's character so that people might observe it and be drawn to him, and to proclaim the truth of God and invite people to embrace him by faith, entering into an everlasting covenant relationship with him. And we are to intercede in prayer on behalf of others for the sake of bringing them into this covenant relationship and to preserve, honor, and exalt his word for the divine relationship uh, and re uh, divine revelation, that is, uh, it is truly before all the world. So these are the intentions that we're supposed to act upon, that we're called to act upon in obedience. And uh, we'll look at this more uh, as we continue through, but that is, is something that is just that guiding light uh, that we need to, to follow, to trust, and obey God, for he's called us to this, and follow the great commission of sharing God's word to all nations, spreading it to all nations, uh, and acting in love, uh, following the fruits of the Spirit, paying attention to our gifts, uh, having fellowship with other believers, constantly be trying to be learning, digging into God's word, digging into prayer and have communication uh, with pastors, deacons, elders, and mentorship with other Christians who are strong in faith so that we may learn and hold each other to account for our actions. And uh, this is all a part of being a Christian. It's all a part of fulfilling uh, God's purpose for us and trusting God that he will work in his timing and trusting that he will not fail in his promises. God will never fail. He always succeeds. Light always defeats darkness. And that is something we need to remember in today's society, especially when we see so much darkness. God is a light. We are called to be a light, the beacon of hope for the nations. 
we are called to be that beacon of hope. So do not fall into negativity. Do not fall into the traps of this world. Let God be your guiding light. Always remember his promises, for he will remain true. Thank you for listening to Cool Explorations. You've just heard from the Gospel by Mike O'Dowd. And uh, this section on letting God's promises be the guide and the light for our life and how important it is to follow these uh, guides that God gives us and look forward to those promises. If you would like to reach me for any reason, you can do so at tpeters745 at gmail.com.